What is up you guys? It's Bob and I bought a house in three duplexes at the same time with literally no money. And by no money, I mean none of my money left my wallet and went into this project at any time. And it's not like my wallet could have helped much anyway because I did this in my early 20s when I still had no money because my net worth at that time was worth somewhere between 50 and 60 Jimmy John sandwiches, okay? So if I can do it, you can do it, anyone can do it. So here is how I did it so that you can go out and someday do it. Let's get into it. So the property is located in Phoenix, Arizona, just north of Sky Harbor Airport. And if you don't know, this area is known for its uh, prostitution, drug use, and feral chihuahua problem. But being a young budding entrepreneur of real estate, I did not let the feral chihuahua problem get to me. So I found this property after about six to seven months of searching and found that they were wanting $210,000 for it. But wouldn't you know it, no one wanted to buy it for that price. So they had taken it off the market and I decided to give them a call anyway and said, hey, I will go to this place, I'll give it a real look, and maybe I'll buy it at the $210,000 mark. And they said, sure, it's not like we got anyone interested in this area anyway. So I went over, I took a look, it was, uh, it was a dump. It was terrible, it was disgusting. It, I don't think it should have legally been in that state with renters. But I did not let the bad state of it get me down. It actually got me really excited because then I came in with a very not insulting at all offer of about $150,000, in which case we basically met in the middle and closed at $172,000. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. How did I actually buy this thing with no money? I did this by finding investors who would partner with me on the deal. And these partners did not come from like my parents who knew somebody or from some like family friend it literally came by me going out and networking with other people at real estate related events and pitching them this i said look i will go find a property i will acquire it because i have a real estate license i will rehab it i will manage it i will maintain it i will sell it when i know the market is going to be good for us and you will get half of the equity and i will do basically everything else. Um, maybe you guys got to help me on the tax forms and the LLC formation because I don't fully get how to do that. But how's that sound? And they said, well, as long as the rate of return is high enough, much higher than regular market, it is worth us doing that. Uh, because no one would partner with you on a deal if they could easily just not have you and it would perform the same. So basically the goal was find a really difficult deal, hence why I was willing to fight off feral chihuahuas for this deal. Now that is not to say that the money did not come without any strings attached because it's not like investors are necessarily lining up to give young 20 somethings a whole bunch of money to go buy their first apartment complex with. There, there was some strings. So the first string is that I actually had to put my name on the loan that we were getting. I had to do a personal guarantee. And this was to make sure that I didn't just, you know, one day give up and run off. Because while they could potentially sue me, I was still worth a resounding 50 Jimmy Johns, and maybe that wouldn't have really paid the lawyer's bill. The other thing I decided to do, and I did this one uh, right up front, I said, hey, look, what I'll do is I am a real estate agent. If I close this deal, I'm supposed to get a commission on it. I'll get a commission on it. And so I will take that commission for closing this deal and I will put that into the deal. And the reason why I agreed to it is, well, I wasn't doing tons and tons of apartment complex deals at the time anyway. And this was just a really great way to do a deal. Now, it turns out actually getting the loan for this property was really difficult for two reasons. The first being the condition of the property was just so low, the banks did not want to deal with it. The second reason is this was actually technically a commercial deal, not a residential deal, because it was over four units. Anything over four units is a commercial property. And it turns out that in a commercial deal, most people do not want to talk to you for anything less than $500,000. 
and this was way less than that. So no banker was really even taking my calls when they found out how much I was trying to buy it for. But you know who was calling me? Those trusty and always there for you guys, the hard money lenders. Always happy to take 2% up front and then another 8 to 11% in interest. What great guys! But I was like, no way, I am not going to do that because this property isn't even cash flowing with a good loan. It is completely wrecked and I do not want to take on that additional expense up front of the 2% that could be going to rehab and then have to worry about your exorbitant monthly payments. So I just kept calling and I kept calling and I kept calling until someone would take my calls. And I found that the groups that will take your calls are more uh, like community banks, credit unions, small banks, maybe even the occasional regional bank. And eventually I found one that was interested. And now a big reason why they were interested, and this is something to look for, is the fact that a lot of these smaller banks will allocate a certain amount of money that has to go back into the community, whereas the larger ones, not necessarily. And so I found that this bank actually had a really big allocation left towards the end of the quarter, and I said, why not my deal? And they were like, yeah, why not your deal? So they took a look at it, they looked at my resume, they looked at my partner's resume, which were way more stacked than mine, so this actually helped get it through, another great reason to partner if you're new. And they said, you know what, we'll do it. We'll give you a great interest rate. We'll give you a great upfront cost. I will work with you on the deal. One thing, you gotta put 30% down instead of the no more normal uh, 20% down. And we were like, ah. And so we looked at our money partner because there was really just one of them that had the money. And they were like, yeah, I got that. And we were like, oh, good. <laughs> that turned out to be around $55,000, which is what uh, she put in. And what she got out of the deal is she actually wasn't getting any equity, but what she was getting was a guaranteed 8% from us two partners, because there was two people actually getting equity, but her money was guaranteed. So she put in $55,000, but she was getting a, a guaranteed rate of return from us of 8%. Now you might be like, Bob, you just said the hard money lenders were between eight and like 10 or 11%. What are you doing? Well, the difference is it's only 8% on 30%, not like 80 or 90% of the deal. So the property was cash flowing. We knew that once we fix it up, the cap rate would be between eight and 10%. So we're getting eight or 10% on the entire property, whereas they're getting 8% on 30% of the property. Are you following this? Hopefully that math helps. So we get the property and I walk onto it and I'm just like, yes, I have bought my first investment property. And I was pretty psyched up until about 20 minutes later when I start knocking on the doors and find out that of the five tenants that were there, uh, three had fled because they'd gotten really used to the fact that they just didn't have to pay rent anymore. Yeah. Turns out the owner during the escrow period became pretty complacent and just stopped collecting rent, saying, I'm basically done with this place anyway, I don't want to deal with any of you. And so knowing that they were very behind on their rent and knowing that this new landlord actually wanted money for the place that they stay in, they just kind of skipped town on me. I will admit that this was an absolute noob mistake and you guys really need to do this when you're acquiring a property, which is make sure that that rent roll is up to date and that you actually get deposit slips, like you actually see the money going in and that they can verify that those deposits are real and are not just on some spreadsheet rent roll. Don't just take the spreadsheet rent roll, people lie. And so now with a mass exodus of tenants on my hands and one very disgruntled drug dealer that I'm trying to kick out, I decide we really need to up our rehab game because I thought we were only gonna be rehabbing three units on the upfront, but now it's five and eventually six when I get rid of the drug lord. So I decide to get two other guys to help me out with doing this. And where we start is by doing the landscaping. And by landscaping, I mean picking up trash three dump trucks of trash. We put in new flooring, new paint, new appliances, cabinetry, countertops, plumbing, electrical, outlets, meters, evap cooler systems, windows, doors, fixtures, and finishes. 
And I would like to note that this entire time, I was being attacked by a gang of chihuahuas who all had decided that this was actually their territory. There was like five of them, and they would always just chase me. And they would always be going for my ankles, and I thought if I gave them the silent treatment, that they would just kind of go away. But after about two months of this, I kind of lost my mind, and I will admit, I chased them, and I corralled them into a corner, and went over them like I was like some kind of bear, and went, Bruh! to them, in which case they were horrified and I became pack leader. But more on those chihuahuas later. Now what was going really well with this property is when I actually fixed up one of those units, turns out we had a line out the door and there was two reasons for this. One is because while we were rehabbing, we were making a lot of noise. I had put up signs saying for lease coming soon. I put a little bit of papers in it. Whenever people passed by, I would wave and I'd be like, hey, we're fixing it up. Because this building I found out was the worst building in the area and everyone thought that was the bad spot in the bad area. And so everyone was a little intrigued to, you know, kind of take a look. And we would let them come in while we were rehabbing to be like, look, and they'd be like, wow, this is actually nice in here. I'm like, I know. And they would like tell their friends, their family, and it actually would be a lot of families, which is what I had counted on. Because while this area was not very good, this micro pocket was notably better than the surrounding area. So what happened is you would have this magnification effect of blue collar people trying to stay here. And the exact people staying there were usually new families because right next to me was a daycare, an elementary school, and some government subsidized programs that would help these new families afford food and other essentials for their new family. And so they loved this spot. And so I filled up every unit like that at the rate I wanted, which was 550 a door. Whereas before it was going for $375 for the entire duplex. So that is a big gain. So now the apartment complex is totally filled. I'm at my market rate. The drug dealer has been booted. Everything's running smoothly. We're actually starting to make some money. And all of a sudden my money partner wants to drop out. So now we need a new partner to cover that $55,000. And if you remember, my bank account is worth 55 Jimmy John still. What happens next is my business partner goes out and talks to another investor that they know to cover that $55,000. And they help put together the LLC paperwork and the taxes as well. And also get a lawyer to help put it all together because this investor was in California making the LLC paperwork and the operating agreement way more complicated because California. But now since this new investor wanted to instead get equity in the deal, we had to renegotiate the entire idea because now we're not just going to pay 8% on the money invested like we were doing with the first investor. So we came to this conclusion of what we would do. We said, okay, fine, whatever money comes in every month net, we'll all split one third each. You get a third, you get a third, you get a third. But the appreciation is gonna be a little bit different. You see, the property appraised at $210,000 when we first got it, but we actually bought it at 172. So we'll cover you all the way up to $210,000 and then we'll split it, partner and I will split it from there. After, of course, she gets all her money back from her investment. And then after that number, my partner and I will split it 50-50. And so six months pass. I find ways to actually raise the rent even more with local nonprofit programs and things like this. And even the chihuahuas, the ones that I had been basically leading every time, because they stayed around, they just stopped barking at me and now they followed me because I intermittently give them water and kibble. Well, turns out the tenants uh, took those chihuahuas and made them their own. So now those chihuahuas have a forever home. And that was very cute and adorable and a nice addition until of course, a few of the tenants went completely insane and flooded two of my units for no reason. Uh, and by mistake, no, there was no mistake. There were cops. Everyone was pointing guns at her. There was, there was drama and she was like, this is your fault. And I'm like, I don't think it is. You're literally standing there just flooding everything. I wish you would stop. So basically why I'm saying this is the maintenance on this place was getting really high. And I was kind of like, guys, this might really turn into a money pit for us. And also this area 
believe it or not, has appreciated a lot. And I really don't know if it's gonna stay that way. And I showed them the numbers we could get, and they were like, yeah, okay, let's sell it. And I put it up for sale, and it sits. Because for the same reason I was able to get such a good deal, it was just as difficult to sell it, even though the market was so relatively good in the area. But the difference was, is I could continue to just hold on to it because it was cash flowing anyway. Uh, aside from the ridiculous calls that I would get every week, it didn't really cost me anything to have it. In fact, I was starting to make more and more money to where I was kind of like, hmm, this is actually kind of nice. But then I would get called again and then there'd be floods and everyone would be screaming all at once. So I was like, eh, maybe we should still sell it. But eventually I sold it and they tried to beat me down, but nope. I got full price by just being really, really stubborn. And if you'd like to know my negotiation strategy on this, it would go basically like this during the inspection. He would go up to something, he'd say, oh, that's broken. Oh, that's terrible. And I would always go, hmm. And then after he did all that, kicked all the tires and cursed the, the complex, he would try to get a reduction and I would just be like, no. And I got full price at $310,000, which is a really great increase from 172. All right, so that's the setup. Now here is the breakdown as to what we actually did when we sold the place, how we actually got ourselves paid. So you remember how the property appraised at $213,000? So what we did is we split all of our capital shares into thirds, as I said, and I got 33.5% of the deal and so did my partner and the new investor got 33%. The reason why we kept the extra 0.5 is so that we maintain control in the property in case anything ever came down to a vote. It didn't, but it's always nice to have that. And so my capital share came to $71,355 and so did my partners. But remember that this new investor had put in a $108,000 loan. So what we did is we took our combined capital share of 71,355 and subtracted that by the $108,000. And when you put that back into the two of us, our principal became $17,355. This was basically the difference between what we bought it for and what we eventually were selling it for. This was our, our principal base. So that is how much we made off of the sale up to $213,000. Now, this is how the rest of it worked for what we actually sold it for, which was $310,000. So what we did is we took the $310,000 amount and we subtracted the cost of the sale, which included the 6% commission fee and 2% for closing costs. You take that total amount, which is $24,800, and you subtract that out of the $310,000. And this leaves you with $285,200. And then I times that by 0.335, how much I made, how much of my equity share that I owned, and that comes out to $25,270. So the total amount I made was $9,300 from the commission, $25,270 from the additional appreciation over the original appraised value, and then $17,355 for my initial principal that I owned up to $213,000. And then additionally, I earned an extra $9,000 because I coordinated the rehabs. Now you might wonder, well, what about the rents? Well, normally there would be a part where I made money on the rents, but here's the thing. That lady really did flood those units and that really wasn't cheap. Not that I'm complaining too much because at the end of this deal, I made a total of $50,925, which is pretty great seeing as I literally put in no money of my own into this deal. It was always just money that I was making in the deal once I'd created it. It was like a little incubator of money. Now, I hope I didn't lose too many of you on that breakdown. I know it was a little bit complicated, but you guys can basically get rid of that crazy part where where there was like two different amounts, like the $213,000 below and then above, it's usually just one, is just because we had to switch out the investors. But I wanted to share that extra level of complexity with you just in case it ever came to you, because let me tell you, I learned so much in this deal. I think I was like 23 when I got into this deal and I didn't know how to do any of this. And I really hope this has helped you guys. I did it all for free. So I would really appreciate a like 
from this video. Drop a comment if you have any questions, if you got lost anywhere in there, or if you have any actually cool stories kind of like this. I mean, there's always something to learn. All right, guys, have a good one. Bye. Hit the button. Yes, you hit the button. Good things will happen if you hit the button. Oh look, you have a little friend. Hit it again. Ah. Okay, now. One of you needs to go through that door. Go, go, go! One more, please.